So um, <laughs> welcome. Welcome, everyone. It is eight o'clock. It is Monday night. It is seems like the second longest year of our life of 2021. Um, and I really hope that um, we just I, we Catherine and I, and we were talking with Joan about this. We just we just really love what we do. And we, we want you to, to feel like you're supported in your roles and what you're doing. And so that's where we're trying to do a few more webinars this week. So um, tonight, I'm just kind of giving some general ideas and maybe some, some tips and tricks that we figured out over the last few years, and certainly over the last four months. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, Tara is going to do a whole um, event on book creators. So how to unpack book creator, really, really important for not only our, our learners who need the, the specific tools for oral, uh, oral communication or uh, video conferencing, but it's it's transformative for students with um, with uh, who are e e uh, ESL learners, uh, French, uh, all of those tools. It's a essential for some, beneficial for all tool if you've never played with Book Creator. And then Wednesday night, the lovely Catherine Wake is going to be looking at Book uh, sorry Hair Deck again, a tool when you're looking at a sea of um, non cameras and how do you engage and try to figure out what the students are doing. Um, uh, Pear Deck is really, really transformative of that. Both of them are amazing for, um, for administrators for gathering that feedback from your, from your staff and the people you're working with. So, um, so that's what we're going to kind of frame today is what are the things that we really want to focus on when we are teaching online and which ones is it just okay to just let go? Because I think what we really need to come away from this year and as we is this and whether it's in January or um, in, in, in this experience of COVID is what are the things we can control? What are the things we can't control? How do we look to tell the difference? And where do we focus our energy? Because if we keep dumping energy and energy after things we can't control, that's not good for anybody. So what I really wanna do is help frame um, how do we do that in an effective way so that um, everybody is benef benefiting from online learning. So why am I talking about this? Well, this is my role for the last three years has been to supporting our e-learning program for the school. So typically e-learning is asynchronous. Um, but a lot of the philosophies we use around an asynchronous community are completely uh, tied to what we are trying to do in the synchronous environment or when we're trying to balance face-to-face -to, -face to not face-to-face. -face. So there's a lot of parallels there. So this is what I've been doing for the last three years. And certainly we've been <laughs> just right in there since September and even in the spring, trying to figure out how do we support people. So um, so that's where I'm coming from. And if you haven't met me before, my name is Steph Pearson. I'm one of the Learning Technologies Consultants and I have the lovely Catherine Wake here again, supporting me. She's also- um, Hi everybody. One of, my, <laughs> one of our super support team. So she is uh, my primary uh, guru. So um, if we get questions around primary school, primary elementary school, uh, primary to primary and junior, we have her to also jump in and try to get some suggestions about how you might tweak this, uh, because my perspective is certainly from high school, but man, have I learned so much from elementary teachers, because if we look at how kinder teachers assess kids, I'll tell you high school teachers, we can learn a lot from them. And one of the big learning is how do we reframe what, what we're asking students to do and what can we learn about their learning from what we're watching. So with that, I'm going to move along. And um, so these are the things that we're hearing about why it's challenging to, to teach online. Um, it is uh, gathering formative feedback. So how do we know where the kids are at? Do they understand the concept that I'm teaching? If I'm just talking about a concept and all their cameras are off, how do I know if they've learned anything? Excuse me. How do I build community in a, in a situation where I may not have met my students, and maybe if this goes into February, we may be starting a second semester where we've never met our students. So how do we build community? My students don't want to engage. They don't want to be on the chat. They don't want to be on camera. How do I deal with that? How do I deal with timing? Maybe it's new content. I've never taught it before. It's all news to me. How do I deal with that? And, um, and how do I make sure that kids are engaged? So. Um, I think even the most veteran teachers among us, we're feeling like we're we're back in year one again, where we're we're like, I don't know anything about my profession anymore. <laughs> like it seems so new. So we also have to get in the mindset of how do we realign what matters most to what's possible? 
And I think finding the balance between two of those um, are going to make things a lot easier for all of us. So here is, and I don't know, <laughs> somebody who was hanging upside down today. Um, like you said, we have so many things that we're dealing with that we are completely, uh, that are 100% new to us, and that's okay. Um, but I think this, ad uh, this adage goes uh, both for our face-to-face -face classroom as well as our virtual classroom. How do we set up opportunities where we are not the hardest working people in the classroom? We have our degrees. We have our extensive educations. We have 10, 15, 30 years of education under our belt. It's not, we shouldn't have to work the hardest. So how do we come up with strategies, um, uh, opportunities that the students are learning how to learn for themselves and we're just there facilitating? And you've heard all this language. Um, it's common to differentiated learning. It's common to deep learning framework. It's common to um, online learning, e-learning, uh, best practice. They're all, there's common themes that come along to it. And all of these ideas are from, um, sorry, are from a single um, article um, that basically took all the evidence-based uh, research around how to best uh, have your highest impact around online learning. So um, it's an Edtopio article and they, and they link to, and so, oh, I should probably share that with you. That would be useful. Um, let me go back here. I will give this copy to you so you can click along if you'd like at home. Um, but this article basically went through all the research around online learning, and um, it determined that um, these are the seven things that we, if we can focus on these seven things, it's going to be better for us and be better for our students, okay? So I've just popped it in chat if you'd like to follow along and maybe click around. And again, it's an adult learning model. So if you get to a point, you're like, what is she doing here? And you start clicking through and you go off on a tangent, we start planning for things in the next few days, great, have at her, I'll still be here. And we are recording, so you could always come back and revisit this. So the first big thing that we can do in order to facilitate online learning for our students is be really organized. So a lot of us are new to HAPR this year, we're new to workspaces. So one of the things we really wanna think about is, do we need everything in a workspace? And the answer is no. You don't need to put something in every single column in workspace. The, the magic column is number three. So if nothing else, you can put that assessment item in that third column and everything else can go in that one product. And why is that important? I'll show you an example of this in a second. If everything is on one document for that student, those students who have navigation issues, those students who have some um, organizational uh, challenges. They don't have to navigate from the meet to the workspace to the work back to the workspace to find the document they needed, the video that they needed to watch. If we do it correctly or if we do it with organization in mind, how can we minimize the clicks for our students who really need to have those clicks minimized and our students who are always have, have no problem navigating it? Well, we can simplify their life too. So how do we think about that differently? So one of the big things is only using that third column because surprise, surprise, if we only use that third column, that's the only thing that shows up on the student view. So instead of having four narrow columns, they see one large column, which again, everything expands so they can see much more things clearly. If you use two columns, so you have gonna have say YouTube videos in column two, and then the evidence card in column three, those YouTube videos become much bigger. So again, they can watch it right into the workspace as opposed to having to click open, finding a YouTube, and then by the end of the day, they're looking at 50 or 60 tabs open at the top because you know what it's like to deal with multiple tabs at the end of the day. Um, your students have the same kind of concerns around digital organization. So how can we minimize how many places they have to go? One of the greatest tools ever created on the planet is Screencastify. If you have never played with Screencastify, that is your job this week. It is going to trans form your teaching practice online. Why? Because unlike in a classroom where you can travel around to each of the students and say, okay, you need some more clarification on this topic, Screencastify allows you to record yourself talking about the assignment or the task at hand. And we would recommend as short as humanly possible. And then you post that to the students for wherever they need to read it or listen to it. 
So your students who need to listen to it multiple times can keep going watching that video over and over and over again. The students who need to clarify, what did she say about that topic? They can watch that video. They can scrub to that point in the video and go, oh, that's where she says it. They can, students who need to watch it with closed captioning can watch it with closed captioning and they'll have that support. So there's all kinds of, so multiple students after a two and a half minute video or maybe a one minute video that you can crank out with your hair all a big mess and you just get it on and you just show that it's okay to not be perfect, but it means, again, here, I'm gonna fix my hair here, uh, but it means that they can get all the learning they need without having to say, hey, miss, miss, come back here, come back here and help me. It's, um, it's all in there and you can just keep saying, it's gonna be in the video. Why don't you watch the video again? See if the video gives you the answer to you. Um, so I'm just going to advance to the next slide here. Um, so we have a few different things we're going to talk about here. Um, as I mentioned, you can think about how your workspace. There can be too much on a workspace. And the more things you put on a workspace, the uh, more confusion that can cause for your students. So really think twice. Is this absolutely necessary? Or am I putting this on just to put it on there because I saw my my peer down the road has 20,000 things in their workspace, then I should feel like I have to do that. Trust us, we have seen and know that there are very, very effective strategies where there's three, four, five cards, that's it. One card, that's it, it's effective. Don't stress about that. So another tool is using a ghost group. So if you've never used a ghost group before, this is, uh, thank you Shannon, the executive functioning. Um, ghost group is basically you create a group in workspace. So maybe actually I will show you what that looks like. So I'm going to pop into my HAPRA today. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like to make a ghost group. So essentially what happens is when I use a workspace and I have my students in, so I'm going to go up to my workspace. I would maybe have a group that is my entire class. Okay. But then I'm gonna just gonna create a group here and I'm just gonna call it the ghost group, okay? So now what happens, notice there's no students in that group. Well, now I can go into workspace and I could make cards. So you can see here at the bottom, it says all groups, oh, cancel. It says all groups. Well, what I can do is I go in here and I edit and I change it from all groups just to ghost group, which means now this is not going to be visible when I look at what my students can see. So I can actually go in and I can hide anything I don't need my students to see. So you can see I've selected, I'm previewing it from those, one of those students' perspectives. I'll show you this way as well. So I'm previewing it from a student perspective. And because they aren't in the ghost group, there's no one in the ghost group, they can't see those two other cards that are at the top here. So I'm going to show you that here from this one. I have two cards here. I can see them as the teacher, but they don't see them. Again, helps with those students who need much more clear direction of where they're going. It requires you to be a little bit organized, but I, I believe that you can handle it, whereas some of your students need a lot more scaffolding. So that's it. So that's a tip there. One of the most cl um, clever things that we've seen is a whole amalgam of how do we set up our documents, the Google Docs that we're pushing to our students in order to make them more useful. Well, since you don't have to photocopy in workspace, use color. And that seems so stupid, but I wanted to say it again. Use color. Color can really draw the eye to what's important. It can really highlight what's relevant to the students. So in this particular activity, it's from a grade eight uh, uh, science project. So these are right out of the expectations of the curriculum. So why am I putting the expectations there? So I want the student to know exactly what they're supposed to be learning. I also need to remind myself, what do the students need to show me and are they going above and beyond that or are they just meeting those criteria? Because if they've showed me that criteria, even though this is not a test or a summative project, if my students can demonstrate that they understand these, they're showing me mastery. And if they're showing me mastery, then we can move on, okay? So um, as again, I've mentioned, here's a screencast. So I'll just show you what this looks like. Um, I'm gonna need to change this to a tab so that you can see it in a tab. 
I'm so excited 23 of us are here to learn today. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, let's give you some time to think about all of the chatting I've already said to you very fast. All right, so, so here's my screencast. So again, here's my worksheet that I'm, that I'm giving to my students. I put it in column three of workspace and I pushed it out. So up here at the top, I'm giving the instructions. So you can see a little preview there and I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. Oh, I just booted myself out. <laughs> Let's try that again. Try it again. Oh, it's here. Hi, Hi friends. Today we're going to learn about automating systems. So automating is a fancy word that means making mechanical something that was once done by humans. So uh, a really classic example of this is instead of using person power or ox power or horsepower to plow a field, we have tractors. So you're gonna read about driverless cars today, um, which is an example of an automated system. So there's a, a video to watch and then there's some reading to do. And then what you're gonna do is answer the questions in the white boxes here. Um, ooh, I see some spelling mistakes, I'll just fix those. And, and you're going to find some other sources and then say, list the source here for me and don't forget to use. Hey, Steph, do you want to just. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so again, um, it goes through the instructions. It gives the big idea. What are they trying to learn about? And it goes through the instructions of the task. The student hasn't had to navigate anywhere else. They can read it. They can they see exactly what the assignment looks like and they know where they need to do the work. So a few little tricks in terms of organization. You can't embed a video in a Google Doc. So I've just taken a screen cap and then you can use the link key. So I've highlighted the box and there's the shortcut is control K, which creates an automatic link. So I can go control K and then it will give me an opportunity to pop in what the YouTube link is. So I can do that. So now a student comes up that visual learner who needs, oh, that's, I want to watch the video. So they click on the video and, or they click on the image and it takes them to, to the, uh, the YouTube video. Excuse me, for my students who may not uh, see that, again, I've just put a traditional link down at the bottom as well. So again, two different places, same video. Similarly here, took a screenshot of the, the article I want them to read. So again, it's that visual cue, looks, makes it look a little bit different than the rest of the document. And again, I've, I've linked the document here too. So again, lots of different ways the students can access this. And it clearly says here in the bright yellow, watch this, read this. Okay, so then we have some questions. And if you'll notice, I've never taught this con concept before. I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. But what did I do is I went back to the curriculum expectations. And I know it sounds totally stupid that I'm saying go back to the curriculum expectations, but it's amazing how when we, Earn a binder or get a Google Drive file from somebody who has taught it before us that we get fixated or the textbook, we get fixated on how it's written in those, um, those inherited works as opposed to what does the curriculum actually say? So the one that we love to talk about is Map of Canada, which is a task grade nine geography teachers love to give is from grade four. Grade four is when you learn to map Canada. So if you can't do it in grade nine, maybe we need to be asking different questions about Canada. And maybe we can get them to understand that British Columbia is on the West Coast and maybe the language of talking about the West Coast is going to get us farther in their understanding of geography rather than memorizing British Columbia being on there. So just uh, go back to the curriculum. What does the curriculum actually say? And how do I teach that as opposed to, do I have to get through this whole textbook? Because I'm reminding you there, we are, it's, you can't do as much work when you're teaching online. So it's much better to condense by going back to the curriculum. All right. So again, this is a, a table that I've added. So when yeah, I start- Do you want to share your screen? Huh. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I did it again. Look at me. Just I keep knocking myself out because it's that kind of day. Um, share my screen. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Um, okay, so um, in so what I've done on this document is I have tables, and so I have my answers or my questions in one in colors in one color, and then I can give my answers on another set 
But what happens is when I put my type, my answers in, so you know, my beloved immersion students in high school, they write all the things all the time in English. <laughs> um, so that box will expand for those students who want to talk a lot, a lot. But my student who doesn't have as much to say, they only, it only just expands a little bit. Or maybe I have a little friend who, who is still learning. So maybe they're going to use the explore tool. So I'm going to show you this little hack here. This explore tool is this little like, I don't know, it's like the, the star of Bethlehem down here at the bottom. So they click this button and it's going to look up that word for me. So here I am, there's the word automation. So I'm going to click on this. It gives me web images and it looks in my drive for words associated to that. So now I'm going to grab this word images and I've got this man dancing with a robot here. And I can just click the little plus button because I want to add and it's going to drop it wherever my cursor was. So now instead of answering, I might maybe where I'm at is I'm going to find pictures that are relevant to me. Or maybe I'm going to um, include this word in my in my first language, in my mother tongue, um, so that I remember what automated because that's maybe where my, my learning is right now. OK, so I can add pictures. Um, I can also, oh, the other beautiful thing about um, using this explore tool is that the image as I added in from the explore tool, it automatically links it to where it's from. So I'm also learning how to uh, make sure that I'm giving credit where credit is due. Okay. So again, I can answer these questions and then here it gives me different types of concepts. And again, I can look at um, I can list my source, so I'm practicing making sure that I'm finding my sources, and then I can tell you why that source is relevant, okay? So there, uh, probably if you looked in the science textbook in grade nine or grade eight, this would probably be five or six pages of having to get through this, and yet here I've hit all of those expectations in one document, okay? So if I'm pressed for time, does this show me that they know what they're talking about? It's a good start. I could also give them this exact same um, assignment and then just change what uh, automated system they're looking at. And then I can look at whether they're developing that understanding over time, okay? So that's all automating systems. Does anybody have any questions about how I've done that or why I would do it that way? Beautiful, all right. Um, oh, Google Docs, why do you wanna use Google Docs? The, we have so many friends who are now transitioning into this remote environment and they're like, I, my PDF, it's so hard to get parents to understand how to send the PDF back, F back to me. My, my families don't have printers. My um, Google read and write doesn't work with PDFs. PDFs are going to make you crazy. So if it is worth giving to your students, it is worth converting it to something that is more useful to your students. Uh, the worse, the older the PDF is, the worse it's going to function with any of our screen reading tools. The worse it's going to function in terms of copying and pasting. So on this uh, tab is how is a really quick cheat way if you're only dealing with small bits of text in order to, um, you basically convert it to a JPEG, so an image file, and then you can pull from the image file, you can pull it um, into a doc. Um, so, there are lots of ways around the internet to help you take a PDF to make it more useful, but then decide why do you like it? Why do you like that PDF? And it's because if it's pretty, we use color. If it's because it has a nice font, Google has an obscene amount of fonts for you to play with. So again, this is something that our team really loves to give feedback for or help with. So if that's something that you are still working from, our team would love to help you with that. Oh Lord, I'm only on number two. Okay, I gotta go faster now. All right, so a lot of what I just talked about in organization really relates to chunking. So we know that we have students who have IEPs that say it needs to be chunked. It works for everybody. What's good for our students who are most at risk is, is good for all of our students. So if we need a word bank because we have some students who need um, to be, uh, who don't do recall, they do recognition, it's really good for our students who are most capable as well because instead of them having to panic about forgetting, they can go, oh yeah, I know what all these words are. I can pull that out. So again, chunking is essential, uh, essential for some, uh, good for everybody. And so when we talk about chunking, we're talking about those overalls and those big ideas, okay? We know that students have reduced capacity to work online. I know certainly as a student of online learning, 
I have such a struggle paying attention. Okay. I am the one with my camera off because I am busy dancing or I'm crocheting to keep my hands busy or something like that. So how many of our students are using those same strategies in order to pay attention? So again, this is where Screencastify comes in. So instead of trying to do um, a lecture style, record your video in, or record your lesson in small little chunks so that students can watch it that way and work at their own pace, okay? Um, alternate brain heavy with low intensity goofy activities, okay? So I'm gonna give you some ideas about that. Excuse me, one of the tricks that some people don't know exists any video, so if you want to take a really quick video, say, on uh, Western expansion in Canada, what you can do is you search for, the, search for the concept in Google, you choose videos, and then in the tools option, you get this idea of any duration. So you can actually choose a short video. So that way you can, again, who's going to watch a 25-minute video when you're not standing over reminding them to do that? So unless it's really engaging, your students aren't necessarily going to do that on their own. So if you choose short videos, you're more likely to have them for long periods of time. So that's a little uh, Google hack for you there. So thinking about those brain heavy activities and those goofy activities. So I want to show you a few different things. So this activity is really great. This is maybe say you've got 10 more minutes. You just need to hold this class together until they go off to see their, their French teacher or or. Um, before lunch. Um, so if you haven't played with quick draw yet, it's going to be your new favorite tool. So right now I have it set on French and I'm not going to embarrass myself with my pronunciation this evening, but I want you to point out that it actually comes in all kinds of languages. So again, this is a really great way to engage learners in your classes who are, who have different languages that they speak fluently. Um, they can have some fun teaching some Italian, some Spanish and Arabic to uh, their peers. So essentially what it does, it's, it, it um, it asks you to draw the Great Wall of China in under, under 20 seconds. So here's me drawing wall. And you can see at the bottom, she's making, I don't know if you can hear her there, but she's making guesses and she guesses in whatever language it is. Um, so this is my very terrible wall of China. It screws it. So basically it's asking, yes, it. But again, for French or language instruction, this could be really exciting. So here's me drawing a tooth. Oh, I know, it's tooth. Okay, a hockey puck. So essentially. I oh, I know, it's hockey puck. I don't know how she knows that, but she does. So now, okay, so there's six of them here. Or Apple, or soda can. Or calendar. <laughs> she does not know what I see remote doing. control. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop or it there, because I'm gonna quit because what I want you to show you is your math applications for this. So 50 million drawings. So the reason that she knows what I'm drawing is because she, they have 50 million drawings of these ridiculous doodles from all over the world. And so I'm gonna just click on trumpet here. So these are the trumpets that have been contributed to this database, okay? If I hover on every single one of them, I get, it tells me where it is and when it was drawn. So now we can start doing a geography lesson. Well, where is the United Kingdom? Is it far away from the United States? What about this one? Is it from the Czech Republic? So now we can start using that data, okay? Um, so there's all kinds of things that you can play around in here. And then if you click here, you can actually pull in big data sets that you can use for a data management class. So again, one stupid tool, lots of fun applications, okay? So that's in Quick Draw. If you have not been to visit Google Earth in recent days, give yourself a fun break or give your students a fun break and say, hey kids, go into Google Earth, see what you can play with. So, uh, so I'm gonna launch this. I'm gonna shut down a few more tabs here because it does not let the kid want to do lots of things. Okay, so Google Earth has all kinds of tools. So. Um, it's more than just geography. It has climate. It has games. It has this great tool called I'm Feeling Lucky, where if you hit it, it's going to take you, rocket you somewhere else in the earth, and you can start talking about why that's relevant. How does that relate to the course content? Um, it is great for storytelling or information gathering. Oh, it's not going to open for That's okay. Um, again, I would really, really recommend you going and playing there because it has incredible, incredible stuff. 
there are these, this little bar here called, um, and it's got nature games, layers, street view, culture, travel, education. So there's little games or, but instead of um, flat experiences about learning about say indigenous languages or um, buildings that show math architecture, instead of just having pictures, it rockets you around the world like you're flying on a plane to all the different locations that have that it's being mentioned in these experiences. Um, so it, it's really quite an incredible tool, right? Again, in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving on here. So other things that you can do to chunk, alphabet organizers, if you, if you have one that you love, great. My favorite is the alphabet organizer. Um, did I say graphic? Anyway, so again, you can see that I have my screencast instructions here, so you can read about what I'm asking the students to do. And so maybe maybe they're doing a short reading on New France and I want them to pull key terms out of this document. Well, how many key terms, miss? Well, there's 25 boxes. Let's try for 18. Can you put 18 words in a box? Every kid can do that. Every kid can put some things in a box. And it might be that a student um, is pulling in um, a picture of a boat because that's a tall ship or they're putting the word France because they're talking about New France. Um, so again, one simple um, graphic organizer, good for every student in your classroom, low floor, high ceiling. Um, this is a whole raft of um, graphic organizers that are all out of Google Draw. If you haven't played in Google Draw, you haven't lived. Um, so lots of really cool stuff in there. Um, again, all kinds of different stuff in here about different graphic organizers that you can provide to your students but you can also teach your students how to make these graphic organizers themselves because again, this is something they're gonna use um, throughout their life. So you can see there's just a whole raft of them in there and they just keep going. And you, it doesn't take any effort to find them on the internet. So again, the beauty of a draw is that um, it works with the screen reader really, really effectively and it expands as students put information in there as well. As I mentioned, Tara's doing a whole webinar tomorrow night on Book Creator. Um, really, really transformative tool. We started working with it originally because it was really served, excuse me, some of our students who are uh, non-readers, um, students uh, with ASD, students with uh, Down syndrome in grades one, two, three. Um, but then we started realizing, actually, this is really good for this activity or that student or this sort of activity. And now we have success using it from kinder all the way through grade 12. Our reluctant readers and writers in grade 12 they will do work on Book Creator because it allows them a little bit more creativity. They don't have to deal with a blank page. Okay, so again, come join Tara tomorrow night. She's going to do a whole thing on Book Creator. Um, and oh, and then so that's just linking to another set. So one of the things that you can constantly do, and I I know I didn't do this as much as I should have in my classroom, was ask for feedback. Tell me, students, what do you like most about what we're doing? What do you want me to stop doing? What do you want me to continue doing? What do you wish I did more of? And one of the feedback I got from my students, which was such an aha moment, they said, we really like all the activities you do, miss, but you do too many of them. We never get good at any one activity because you're always changing the activity. It was a new tech tool or whatever. I was trying to do way too many things. And so after that, I was like, okay, we're going to get, we're going to use three tools all semester and that's all we're going to do. And they're going to get really, really good at those tools. Okay. Um, you can use, so now with breakout rooms, you can, with our enterprise, in the triangle square circle on your Google Meet, you've got Google polls, you've got question and answers, you could use Google Forms, you could use Pear Deck, you could use something like Edpuzzle, um, all of those things to get that immediate feedback from your students when you can't see them nodding or appreciating the wonder, wonderful activities that you provided. There are ways to pull data about that as well. OK. Um, and again, when we're talking about how do we make this most effective for your students so that it, you're not pulling your hair out, that the students are actively engaged is provide voice and choice. So if you haven't experienced Kat Tuckler, Tucker, this is some of the amazing work that she's doing. Um, but essentially, um, she's got this whole choose your adventure um, activity where the students start. They have to choose one from each column. Then they have to think about and then they have to write and dry and so we have this whole template but essentially it takes the students through a series of steps so that they're taking the concept that they wanted to learn about 
um, that may be under the expectation that you're trying to learn, um, but they would drive their own thinking, right? So there's the template for that is in here so that you can grab a copy of that and then um, provide the format that you want the students to do, okay? Um, and again, there's book creator because we can't say enough about how we love it. And I thank you, jo Joan, for the shout out earlier. Book creator is great for administrators as well, okay? Um, but what is the big thing we have to remember when we allow students to choose their own learning? We have to make where the end goal is very, very clear. So we need to say to them, I will know you know about this specific expectation or this overall expectation when you can do this, this, and this. And so when those students come back, Miss, I didn't understand why I didn't get a level four. Well, show me the success criteria. Where in your activity? Again, that is not onus on you as the teacher, it's on the student. How do they know they got to level four? And if you've articulated those success criteria enough and clearly, then they should be able to articulate that back to you. Okay, keeping an eye on my time here. So one of the things that is kind of lost in our, um, our world when we moved to uh, Prezi was the uh, ever-present PowerPoint animations. But they can be really, really helpful when we're online teaching to pull students' attention to different things that we're trying to learn. Um, so using annotations um, in Google uh, Slides, if you've never played with it, down here you've got this little pointer tool. So if I select it, you can kind of follow my little, oops, try again, go back here. I can um, highlight things with my little uh, pen pointer here, okay? And in case you also haven't note, learned this either, you've also got closed captioning here at the bottom. So I can click closed captioning and you can see the words that I'm speaking. Um, this might be really useful for online learning um, if a student isn't able to hear you. If you have the closed captioning on in your slide deck, they'll be able to read as well as hear. So that can be really useful as well, okay? Um, so I'm gonna turn both of those off. Um, one of the tools that we've, so we have some mixed uh, experiences around uh, HAPRA highlights. So because one of the things is like, oh, I just want the students to only go to specific websites. I hate that my French students go off to these really complicated sites or they just find an English site and they translate it into French. Well, there's a whole, uh, section here on how to create a custom Google search. And essentially what that is, is it allows you to choose the websites that you want the students to use to learn from. So if you have a student, uh, let's say, um, you have the students who are, are their, their reading ability isn't uh, fully developed yet, um, maybe you choose uh, links that have um, a reading level that's more attuned to their needs. Um, maybe you don't want them to find the American stuff and they get it confused with Canada. So you're going to give them the, all the searches that are relevant to Canada or a particular period of time. Um, excuse me. And then what essentially you do, so you basically build your own website, web search with like links that you are choosing and that, excuse me, and then you give that students that link. So if I go to this link, and I search um, Pearson, I'm gonna get all the things around Pearson, but it's only gonna be from those websites that I gave the students to look at. So you can pop this sort of, um, this link into your workspace so that you can keep bringing that back to students, or you can pop that link in on the top of a work, Word document, sorry, a Google document that you want the students to use. So again, trying to help scaffold the internet a little bit for your students, all right? Um, an Ed puzzle, if you haven't had a chance to play with it, basically it allows you to upload a video and then stop the video at various points and have the students answer questions about what they're learning. So, and again, what's great about that is that even their free version, it allows you, it creates a data a dashboard that gives your students your feedback about where the students, how long they watched the video, did they get the questions right, were they engaged, how long did they stay on the video. Um, so there's some really cool things with Ed puzzle. You can also use uh, videos in Google Forms, again, asking the students questions about the videos that they watch, okay? But the really big thing here is, um, the, the really important thing here is coming back to this idea that we need to, on an online learning environment, we need to put more emphasis on mastery, not marks. 
We want the students to come back and check that they know that they're learning, not to be penalized that they don't know something, not to feel that they shouldn't try because they're going to get, uh, they're going to have a negative experience. So um, one of the ways you can do this is here's a Google quiz. I want you to do this quiz as many times as you want until you get 100%. You can use any resource you want in order to find those answers. If I'm talking to my friend on a Google chat and say, what did you get question one? Oh, I didn't get that answer. Oh, they're talking about your course. Isn't that what you want? So again, how do we reframe what we expect from our students? Because there is no control that we have beyond this computer screen. We don't know what they're doing at home. So how do we make that more comfortable for us and not have to worry about whether they're finding it on their phone or the internet? So um, give them an opportunity to look up the answers as many times as they want. So a few different ways to do that. So we have, oops, oops, oops. Um, this one is using uh, Google Sheets. So Tracy Nazrella, she did this incredible activity where she used the, the form. Now, this is, this is not for the faint of heart, um, but she basically used Google Sheets um, and used the conditional formatting. So when they get the right answer, the, uh, the document turns the right color. Let's see if I can. Um, anyway, so, so it's kind of a neat little activity. Um, you can make quizzes in forms if you've never played along with that. Um, so that's there available for you. Flippity is a really neat little site. So essentially it gives you a, um, you make one Google sheet that has the key terms of your unit on it. And then it allows you to make a whole raft of games along with that set of tasks. So um, really great for terms, that sort of stuff, word clouds, um, really, really great stuff. They have a whole thing about how to think about um, e-learning, um, so online learning. Uh, but again, you just create a Google spreadsheet and then you can use all of these tools. It's a really fun way to get kids to practice what they're doing. Okay. And the other thing is just get your kids to practice asking questions, right? Um, if they're not communicating to you, maybe it's because they don't know what, the, what questions to ask. So why don't you ask a question? Why don't you practice asking questions? And there's lots of our curriculum um, where that's one of the overall um, expectations is, is certainly to ask good questions about the so again, embrace that in these weird times. Um, like everything OCSB, connect with your students. How do we do that? Well, make sure your profile picture in Google is you or something that represents you. It's amazing how often that we look at just letters um, and there's all these people and well, what, what, how do I build community if I only see a letter? What do I know about you if I've never met you face to face? Um, use your face in your own screencast. So if I'm going to make a screencast about an activity, I'm going to put my face in it. So my students remember that I'm an actual human being and maybe over time, they'll start feeling comfortable about doing that as well. Um, we need to be communicating as often as humanly possible. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll do a whole activity about how to use Gmail really super effectively because there's really good ways to be able to communicate with our students more effectively in that way. Um, this gold uh, Tara found today um, it's essentially um, check-ins using uh, Google Jamboard. And I might have to wait a second for that because it's probably still getting in Google Earth. Yes, I am. All right. Um, so what, what's really neat about these is that, again, you, could, you can't take a single page from a jam and use it, but you can make a copy of the whole jam and just delete the ones you don't want to use. So here we go. You can see my internet's very slow today. Yada, yada, yada. Um, but essentially, you can have, you could ask the question, the students a question, and then they say whether they agree or they disagree. And what I love about it is the ASL that goes along with here as well. Um, there's another cute one here. Um, what's complete? What's missing? We've got some yes and no. Again, a way to have the students gather opinion, collect information, do some formative assessment, formative feedback about how your students are experiencing the learning that you're doing. And these are all abilities to check in with your students. Um, Mike Bernards, I posted about how to change your Google uh, image. And the next thing you know, he basically gave a profile challenge. So every two times a week, he encourages his students to change their pick to go in a new theme. And so uh, superheroes and primary school images, so cute. Um, and now it's insects. So again, a different way to demonstrate different types of conversations about um, students, okay? Um, the, 
this whole document is different ways to use different tools to give better feedback. Again, those abilities to connect with our students. If we can't have those one-to-one -one conversations with our students, how do we provide feedback in a Google Doc that maybe uh, in uh, invigorates those conversations? And again, there's your how to change your image in Google Profile, okay? Um, if you're having an online discussion, which we don't have great tools for uh, at this current time, um, there's some examples there as well. Both my videos are going to start now, so thank God that first part is quiet. All right. Um, and again, there's all kinds of conversations that we're hearing about turning your cameras on or off. Um, this has uh, a really neat perspective, this particular article, and it basically says, um, we need to create an environment that students want to participate with their cameras on. So how do we do that? Um, how, do we, how do we get to a point where they are comfortable having those conversations? And maybe with breakout rooms, maybe that's those opportunities. Um, but uh, we really need to be respectful of why a student may not be turning on their camera. And there's a thousand reasons that we often can't even begin to, con to, to consider. So. Um, what do we really need the students for their videos? And if it's a real need, then you need to have those conversations. Like I need to see that it's you sitting in front of your camera at eight o'clock when we log in. So if you can just kind of pop on for a second so I can see it to you and then be off, that's fine. But again, these are conversations we have by building community. If you haven't played with Flipgrid, it's also another great tool. And again, these are just some of the ways that you could use Flipgrid. And even since this infographic has been created, so in the last six months, Flipgrid has uh, a thousand different things you can do with it. Arguably, it's not really that simple anymore, but there are some cool tools. And if you and your the, the other teachers that your students have are using these tools, they get better and better at using them. So really, really great tool. The last one is really important. You matter, my teaching friends, colleagues, administrators, you matter. You can't pour from an empty cup. So if you get to Tuesday afternoon and you've been running frantically, it's okay to say, hey kids, I'm gonna give you some asynchronous time. I'm gonna catch up with you in the morning because I need to take a breath. I need to have a nap because I can't keep going at this pace. There is no shame in that. And we have the opportunity to, to, to slow down in this environment that we don't have when we are face-to-face -face with students all the time. But even think about that, even when we are face to face with our students, when we really needed a time out, we would be able to send the work to students to some simple work that they could handle, or we put on a video and we'd sit at our back of the class and just try to collect ourselves. But if we are obsessed with having to be online the whole time, then we're not giving ourselves those five minute breaks, those 10 minute breaks, where we just need to have quiet time. So Think about how often you give yourself quiet time in your face-to-face -face classroom and have you built that into your online environment as well because that's totally valid, especially if you're dealing with little people at home. I'm dealing with my cat and man, is she needy. But these are the things that you need to build in your time and it's okay because you can't pour from an empty cup, okay? You don't need to do all the things. And if you tweak a few different things in your program, I think what you'll find is you'll be able to carve out a little bit uh, more time for yourself. OK, um, if you haven't discovered schedule send in your Gmail, um, if you hold anyway, check it out. It allows you to answer an email, but to schedule when it's going to be delivered to the person. So even though you are answering your email at 10 o'clock at night, you can have it delivered to whomever at 8 a.m. in the morning so that they aren't disturbed, even if you're up late. You can even teach your students how to schedule send so that they're sending at a respectable hour and not at all ages. But also remember guys, there's nothing to say that you can't turn your Google off on your phone. So turn off the notifications you don't need. If it's not a notification from a human being, you shouldn't have it on because it's gonna drive you crazy. Um, if your principal really needs to get a hold of you, they'll call you, I promise, they have your number, okay? So those are things to keep in mind. The last thing I wanna do in the last 10 minutes here is just give you some more ideas of where we're going. As I mentioned, there's the book creator tomorrow night at eight o'clock, Pear Deck on Wednesday night. Uh, we have a 30 minute blitzes. So Wednesday morning, I'm gonna do uh, how to use those neat uh, tools. And then Catherine's gonna do tomorrow morning, um, how ECEs, EAs and other roles who aren't necessarily owning the meet, how they can interact with people in those opportunities. So um, that is where our school, that is where LT is going this week. Um, but we have 10 more minutes. So I wanna just pause there. I went- Can I just type in for a second?
Yeah. Perfect. I mean, what more is there to say? Game, set, match, do the cabbage patch. Thank you, Steph. That was <laughs> fantastic. And I just want to say too, is that I think your perspective is so unique because you have been an e-learning teacher for many years and now you're in this role. So these are tips that have been built from not just this pandemic learning, but prior to that as well. And I think I know Jody's on the phone call as well, or on the Google Meet as well, but no, coming from the virtual elementary perspective, as well as the virtual academy perspective, we know that this is successful. We have students that are really thriving in this environment. So if we flip that to how as we as educators can engage them in this style of learning, because it is working uh, for some students, you know, I always think back to the AQs that I've taken and what did I enjoy from that style of learning and what didn't I like? And so bringing that um, to your online learning, I think is really important as well. So Steph, like it was bang on, bang on. <laughs> Thank you, Tessa. My greatest cheerleader. Um, do, I don't know if there was any great, um, any questions or anything you'd like me to go go over again. I'm gonna see if my Google Earth is back up so you can see all of its glory there. Um, because again, it's it's a pretty incredible tool. I'm gonna just jump in there so that you can see it's all its glory here. Um, so for example, so I talked about the little, I feel lucky tool. So this is the little dice. So I'm going to roll the dice and it's just going to pick somewhere in the world. So we're going to go to the Schwarza, a tributary in Germany. So all of a sudden think about all those words I just learned. What's a tributary? Think about the geography I can learn, the English words. Okay. And then I can click here and I can get some more information about this place. It's going to also zoom in so I can look at this beautiful location um and uh and look at different people who have taken pictures about this place okay i'm gonna go back out here and then back out and um again lots of things i can join zoom in i'm gonna, gonna hit lucky get lucky again so now this is moira england so again now maybe i can start writing a story so what happened from my character at this river in germany and how did they get to the national forest co in in England. So maybe that's going to be generate some ideas for my students. I can measure for my math friends here. I can measure down the street of this road. Okay, or maybe I want to zoom out. Zoom, 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 Zoomy, 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 zoomy. So again, I can zoom all over the world and I can maybe start doing that. Okay, now I've got 3,890 meters. So now I'm going to start doing conversions. Well, how many kilometers is that? How many centimeters is that? Okay. Um, I can, I can do uh, various uh, types of maps here. And I can also do this Voyager, which is, this is where all the games come in. So again, my art teachers out there, lots of incredible um, experiences here around architecture and art. Um, Lots of, for science, so um, uh, preservation, animals, all kinds of stuff around that. There's some science stuff for space. There's also um, games. So again, low, uh, low brain activity. We can talk about animal calls. There's uh, Carmen San Diego is in here. There's three games that are all about Carmen San Diego and, and trivia and that sort of stuff. Um, culture is really awesome. Um, they've done some really incredible stuff being super inclusive about um, celebrating non-Western civilizations here. So um, some really, really cool stuff in that as well. Um, Steph, you got a great question from Leslie um, mm -hmm. looking at, are there additional strategies to move from marks to mastery in credit classes? Alternatives to high stakes assessment teachers have relied on. Oh, Do you know if there's a bank? <laughs> I know you could go on and on for another couple hours, but is there a bank of ideas for nine to 12? Yes, we started generating when we were worried about uh, what the RSTs and the exams look at like. Um, the grade nine to 12 consultant team started putting together a really amazing document about how to think differently about even an exam question. What does an exam question look like that really gets down to what a mastery is rather than ticking off the box? So we do have a raft of, of resources. Um, so Leslie, I'll send it your way so you can sh uh, share it with your friends and family. Um, but essentially comes down to, um, we know you have access to the internet. 
go and find three different places that help you solve this math equation and tell me which one is best. So then the students really have to think about how the question is answered in order to demonstrate if they knew that, that there was a difference between the different ways that the websites answered that question. Or that's a really good question. Um, yeah. Um, I really appreciate so many people coming out to learn so late at night. I am fully going to bed after this, for the record. 